Good afternoon, brothers. God bless you. Welcome one more day to this time. This is space that aims to answer questions that we receive practically every day and that help us to get closer to God and His Word because we have in our hearts a genuine desire to learn to know more and more of God and His Word. And I thank all of you with all my heart for the questions that you continue to be sent to us practically every day. This also forces us to study to prepare ourselves to deepen in the sacred scriptures for at this time that we have called the online pastor, as you know, well, we are able to give biblical answers to those doubts, that, to those questions that you ask us. It is not that we know everything, but I repeat, it's something has something very positive that it forces us to investigate to death and study the scriptures. And today we have received, during these last days, rather, we have received questions that are very interesting from your part. We are going to see how far we can go, and we are going to pray to ask for wisdom to the Lord, and that for everything we respond, and all the time that we are together, we can learn. I'll give you a little advice that I give to you. How how good could it be if you had a paper and a pencil at your hand so you can write down verses, you can write down certain and things that may come in handy after the end of this pro program for you to review notes that you have taken? Because I think it's very difficult to remember everything that is going to be shared this afternoon. So I'm going to give you some time so that while I'm speaking for a few minutes you can look for a paper and pencil or a notebook and write down the answers to the uh, questions or the biblical texts or things that are going to be more interesting or appropriate so you can review later on. This is the moment, this is the day that God has given to us for us to study His Word so we can get closer to Him. And that is why we are going to ask the Lord for Him to give us wisdom from above so that together we can learn many things from our God. And above all, Pay close attention now. It's not the time to say hello. It's not the time for you while I'm speaking to be talking and asking and commenting on things between you now. It's the time to listen, to pay attention. And later at the end, if you want, you can say goodbye. You can send me greetings, those little hearts, those thumbs up that you like so much. But I think that now is the time to pay attention. I think now is the time to stop writing, stop commenting, and focus on pay a close attention to what the Lord has prepared for each one of us today. So let's pray, brothers. Blessed Heavenly Father, I give you thank you very much for this privilege that you give us once again, one more week, to be able to be here live at this time of the afternoon, this time of the day, to answer so many questions that we usually receive nearly every day. Lord, we depend on you and we give us wisdom from above so that we can help the brothers who ask us about your word. We put ourselves in your hands and we ask that you bless all the time that we are going to be here in the name of Jesus. I know that uh, many listen to us from many places. Check the time you have now in your country so you know that every Monday at this time, 6 o'clock in the afternoon, although a few minutes have passed, we will be always here. We have been doing it since last year. It has already become uh, something usual that once a week we stop along the way to study together the Word of God. And I'm going to answer the first question we have received from Lorena. Por parte de Lorena. She says that reading and wanting to learn more about the Word of God every day, she has come to that passage of Romans, chapter 3, from verse 1 to verse 8. And she asks, Paul, is he speaking about the law because I don't understand anything? Let's see, chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the Romans, that Paul letter to the Romans is a very interesting, interesting letter that contains very deep teachings. And also, you have to know that the Old Testament very well, a lot, in order to understand many of the things that Paul is talking about here. 
because it, the uh, recipients, although the letter is called Paul's letter to the Romans, he was actually writing to the Jews of the Church of Rome. Most of the brothers who congregated in that congregation were Jews. Many of them say some commentators that they had been uh, converted to Jesus during the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Therefore, they were very knowledgeable of the Holy Scriptures. They knew perfectly the Scriptures of the Old Testament. And that is why Paul touched topics that unless the Old Testament is known very well, it will be very difficult to understand certain things because it speaks of characters, one of them, Abraham and others that if you don't know the life, the trajectory of this great man of Khan, then uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, understand uh, what Paul is trying to share. Chapter 3 of Paul letters to the Romans is embe embedded, if I may use that expression in another chapter, chapter 2 where Paul has been developing a topic, is touching on different topics, talking about different things, the law, the Jews, the privilege that uh, they had, the circumcision, etc., etc. In chapter 3, if you're observing your Bible, that I hope you have it, open by Romans chapter 3, above chapter 3 there is no title, because really the topic that Paul has been discussing has been exposed. He has been developing it since chapter 2. Paul is talking about the law, the purpose of the law, the objectives of the law of Moses. And he's touching on different topics. For example, one of the things that he talks about is about circumcision, the true circumcision, not the one made in the flesh, but the hard one. And Paul is developing some very interesting topics to bring his audience and to the readers of his letter in the future to the area that the law had some objectives. The main was... The main one was to prepare the people of Israel so that when the Messiah arrived, he would be the only human being in all the history of humanity that would comply with all the requirements of the law. They could recognize that the law was not a goal or an objective to reach, but a mean to reach Jesus, because the law... The Torah, which are the five first books of the Bible, Genesis, Levitical, Exodus, Numbers, without Jesus is empty, where the law points, what is the objective of the law is to bring us to Jesus. That is the objective. That is like the uh, final station of the law. All the sacrifices, the tabernacle, all they received during the period in the desert, all that points to Jesus. Nobody could fulfill the law because it is a perfect law, a law that expresses the heart of God for that moment for the people of Israel. And the law, I repeat, was not a goal. It was a means to achieve some objectives. Now, you say that you don't understand what Paul is dealing with here. Well, I just say is you have to know the Old Testament very well in order to understand what Paul is developing in that passage. For example, when he says in the chapter 3, verse 1, what advantage does the Jew have or who takes uh, our advantage of circumcision? So there are two questions. In any case, first, certainly because the word of God has been entrusted to them who receive the word of God, the Philistines, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, they did not receive it. It was the people of Israel. And preserve, they preserved it. They passed it on from generation to generation. And we will be eternally grateful to the people of Israel because they received the word and transmitted it, and it has survived to this world day. And thank God that we also have the blessing and privilege of being able to read it in our main language. Then he says, because them, some of them have been incredulous. If they had the word practically from the cradle they are hearing, how at the moment of truth when they should have recognized Christ as the true Messiah, they did not. 
Instead of a false messiah, how come they did not believe? And then Paul says, his disbelief has made God's fidelity not, not, not at all, not any attitude on the part of human beings wherever he is a Jew or does not nullify the fidelity of God. God will continue to be God with Israel or without Israel, with church or without church. I have said many times it may sound strong, but it's like this. God does not need us at all we him we do need him for everything as separated from him we are nothing he without us remains God because he has been God and will remain God for eternity before the foundation before the existence of Israel before the existence of the church therefore God does not need anything nor anyone he says sufficient which is really what means the name Shaddai he does not need anything nor anyone It's true that some Jews, although they knew the law, although they knew the prophecies, they did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but not all of them. Sometimes it's exaggerated when it is said that the Jews rejected the Lord, not at all, because the first Christians, the first followers of Jesus were Jews. The pastors, the apostles, those that spread the gospel, they were Jews. So that all that people of Israel rejected Jesus, that's not true. Part of the people of Israel rejected Jesus. Most of them religious, but we have, for example, very important characters like Paul, that some... Uh, they don't like it because logically he was a Jewish rabbi, an expert in the Torah, an expert in the law, and that he converts to a Jewish rabbi and that he tells the Jews that what is that they have to convert and follow Jesus. So many don't like this because they keep on wanting to keep the law because they forget that the objective of the law is Jesus. The law does not lead us to Jesus. That's the pure reality. The Christian does not have to return to the law, but the one who is unique and exclusively in the street compliance with the law has to go to Jesus. Therefore, this chapter 3, I repeat, is within chapter 2. That has been developing the issue of the law, the issue of the privilege that the people of Israel had, but privilege that made them responsible because whom much is given, You know that the Bible says that many will also be demanded. Therefore, the Jew had many privileges and so many miracles. They can say they were God's chosen people, but some serve him very little or nothing because all the privileges are useless if you were at the time of the truth when you have to accept and follow and obey Jesus, you do not follow him. So, as the Bible says, If you don't have the son, you don't have the father. And the one that has the father has to have the son. So the objective of the Paul's letter to the Romans is to bring the recipients to the immense of, or most of them to know that the objective of the law is that we recognize and we know Jesus as the true Messiah. That is the priority objective of the law. Everything else, everything else, the rest is secondary. Something very important also, without the New Testament, the law is empty. It is, a, it is as you plant a seed and a tree grows, but it never ends bearing fruit. The fruit that produces all of that is the church, the Gentiles converting to the God of Israel and also being light to the nations. That is a fundamental objective of all history, miracles and actions and performance of God in what we call the Old Testament. If you want, we will advance because there are other questions that will also take us a while to develop. A sister who asks or wants to know what Jeremiah 31 means. Let's go and read Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 30, verse 22. 
¿Hasta cuándo andarás errante? Says the word of God. Till when, when will you be wandering, O daughter, with your more? Because Jehovah will create a new thing on earth. And says the woman will surround the man. I imagine uh, what called you, or do you want to know it's the meaning of that uh, phrase that says that women will surround the man? I go back to say something similar to what I just said with Romans chapter 3. Uh, the prophet chapter 31 of prophet Jeremiah starts the development of everything that is trying to explain and share the prophet Jeremiah and it starts from chapter 30 if you realize chapter 30 is speaking to the captives who will return from exile when they were in Babylon. They are promised that they will return and many of them did not return because logically they died in captivity in Babylon. It did not last for a week nor a day but for 70 long years and many of them that were taken deported to Babylon, Babylon they did not return. Others were born in captivity and they did not know Jerusalem. They did not know those things that they had happened in Jerusalem in the temple. They heard them from their parents or their ancestors but they did not experience them in their own flesh. And others never wanted to return to Jerusalem. They stayed in Babylon living and they uh, took root there. Ahora bien, a lo largo Through del chapter 30 or 31st of the prophet Jeremiah, God has been saying that there will be a serious, uh, in the future, of, there will be some changes in the future. One of the most important is that the good stop being captives in a foreign country like Babylon and good return again to their land. Once again, the temple would be rebuilt, the walls again, the sacrificial system, etc., etc. And one of the things that collides with all that story and all those changes that are going to take place in the lives of thousands and thousands of captives that they will return to their country again is what we have read tonight in Jeremiah 31st uh, verse 22. The woman will surround the man. The man. Last week, I think I remember that I said that sometimes it's good to see what other versions of the Bible say to compare if what I do not understand in a version such as this one that I just read in King James, uh, what I do not understand, I can understand it maybe in another version. So let me share a version of the same verse of the Bible, but in another version of the Bible, that instead of saying the woman will surround the man, says a woman will uh, go after a man. It changed a little bit. It's not the same surround that maybe go after a man. Uh, we have to analyze the text in the original language. And I have here in front of me my annotations, the whole verse. 22nd of Jeremiah 31st in Hebrew. And I was analyzing, analyzing and studying word by word. Let's analyze the phrase that the woman says will surround the man. The phrase in Hebrew would say that with B. Gaver. This is what the original text said before. This, as uh, is said before, is understood perfectly. Various personalities, various scholars of the Bible, such as Cyprian, Augustine, Jerome, etc., they understood that in this text a reference was made to the incarnation of Christ through the Virgin Mary. But with all due respect to these characters, they were totally wrong. Because here the Virgin Mary does not appear anywhere. Therefore, the explanation they give in their generation, in their time, is totally wrong. Because the word nekeba, the word nekeba, that is the word that is used in this verse and is translated by the word woman, in no time, in Hebrew, it means virgin. It does not mean virgin. Therefore, we are not going to put the virgin where the verb, where it's not. 
eh, el verbo Otherwise, rodear, que es the el verb verbo surround, pone a un lado la idea de concebir. Puts aside the idea of conceiving. No It has concebir, nothing to do no with conceiving. Ver, has, no has nothing to do with Mary. Marriage. Has nothing to do with a virgin. Therefore, we have to discard explanations to the text that have been erroneously given throughout history. The reference to the divine que se da, por ejemplo, to virgins that is given, for example, in verse 4, we can see virgen, that that virgin that is mentioned cuatro, in verse 4, let me read it to you, we are in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 4, I will build you and it will be built, O virgin of Jerusalem. De, de Israel, perdón. From Israel, for, sorry. Virgin of Israel, you will still be adorned with your tambourines and you will go out in joyous dances. When the word virgin is mentioned in this verse, it's speaking about Israel, it's not talking about the Virgin Mary. Now, in the context of chapter 31 of Jeremiah, it's talking about Israel, of the people of Israel. And to make a correct exegesis, that is, to be able to extract the genuine and real deep meaning of the text, we have to analyze the meaning of the words, and neither the word virgin nor the word conceive appears nothing to do with this word, nekeba, which means woman. It speaks of a woman, not of an individual, not a person or a man, nor a woman, but a collective. Therefore, we have to start from the basis that we are talking about a new relation, a fresh relationship, a relationship of proximity that Israel will have with her husband, with her God. That's what the text is talking about. The truth is the woman who is Israel is going to enter into an intimate relationship with her husband, who is the people of Israel. He's saying, the virgin of Israel, my beloved, my girlfriend, my wife Israel, as the people of Israel are called in the Old Testament, who has been unfaithful to me, and that is why I have led her to captivity. She will come back to me and surround me and be close to my heart. And pay close attention to all these explanations, because later on we will answer a question that a sister asks us about the book of the Song of Songs. She will come very well, remember, it will be very good to remember what I'm saying now. Then Israel would return, return from captivity and get closer to God and have a relationship of more intimacy and more communion with their God. Then the context of Jeremiah chapter 31 talks about Israel, how he would be close again, because really, the most correct translation would not be that the woman uh, goes after the man, but that the woman, Israel, will become close to embrace, will have a truly communion with the man, and in this case, the man represents God, the communion of the church, forgiveness, and there, I want to do a little stop on the way after giving a brief explanation about this text when someone says, I do not understand the purpose of the book of the Song of Songs in the Bible, what I do not extract practically anything from that book, and no, I don't understand it well. Um, well, the fact that you do not understand the objective from the book of the Song of Songs in the Bible does not mean that the book, the Song of Songs, does not have to be in the Bible. The book of the Song of Songs is a real relationship that existed between King Solomon and a woman with whom he was madly in love. It is the true story of a love relationship of genuine and true love between Solomon, the beloved, and his and the Sulamita, in this case, is the beloved. Now, only the book of the Song of Songs, it relates the passionate love of Solomon with that woman. It is only that it's like a kind of pink novel. It's much more than this. Behind the superficial account of the Song of Songs, we have to see that this book represents, symbolizes a love between God 
madly in love with a people who at that time were the people of Israel, but who eventually throughout the history, the people of Israel, let's say it could not be uh, the only one that uh, would be the loved people by God, but we, as the Bible says, uh, the Lord tells the Gentiles, you who were not a people, now you are God's people, royal priesthood, holy nation, people acquired by God, so that you announce the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into light. Admirable. This is the goal, fundamental goal of the book of the Song of Song is the real story of a love of a king with a true woman. He tells in a very way, very poetic style, poetry, uh, Hebrew poetry, he talks about the hair, talks about the body, about the eyes, about the lips, about the love that this man feels for this woman, of the love that this woman feels for him, of the problems that sometimes there have been, or how she does not open the door to the beloved when he develops, wants to enter and wants to have communion with her, and she has the excuse and put the excuse that She's not going to get up and open the door because she just washed her feet. Then she realized he, of the terrible mistakes he has made of rejecting the call of the his beloved. And then when she goes out and opens the door because she realized of the mistake, he, uh, the majority are not there. Like there was a time in history that uh, the presence of God uh, left and the glory of God left the temple and the people of Israel remained like this woman from the book of Song of Songs, desperate, sick of love, as the book says, that the woman seeks desperately and there we hook that desperate search for the beloved of the Son of Songs with Jeremiah 31st, verse 32, where it says that the woman will surround the male, Israel will desperately want to have love again, to want to have a relationship with her, his beloved, with, and that we want to unite to show that the beloved, in this case, was the people of Israel, there will be a time when Israel will recognize yes or yes, that her beloved, that her beloved is the Messiah. The Messiah has already come and died for the entire human race, including Gentiles, including people from the people of Israel. We do not worship the Torah, we do not worship the law, if we do, but we worship the God of the world. The world lead us to God, and God lead us to his word, but you will worship the Lord your God, and you will only serve him. We do not worship the Bible. We do not worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. Therefore, it's very important that we realize that these refreshing times of a spiritual renewal I, I, I give my opinion and I believe that I also have the right to give my opinion. I believe that they have started these uh, refreshing times since last year when we began to live a different life. We have begun to have a relationship with a different, uh, a different relationship uh, in a different way with God. And there are thousands, yes, thousands of brothers all over the world. Uh, there are many nations on earth that are called, they were called, they didn't know, they didn't want to congregate, they were injured and humiliated by many congregations that no longer had a church near their area or near their city or the place where they live with sound doctrine and in the midst of this pandemic with programs like this one and surely others, more became, they have returned to, fi to feel passion for the gospel and love for the word of the only God and desire to learn from the Lord and for me it's a reason for tremendous joy and I will never forget in my life uh, all what God has been doing and he continues doing because obviously we are not going to live forever at least here on earth but we know that during this time many of you that they were they were don't get angry you were cold you were out of the way of the Lord 
Estaban you were like an old piece of furniture that didn't even know where to no go and they didn't trust pastor or churches or anything or anyone else. You have woken up in the hearts of many of you. Glory to God. Glory to God. And love and passion for Jesus that has no limits and has already passed. passed. We are going to be next month a year since those first devotionals, since those things, first programs of the online pastor. The Lord has been doing something extraordinary because I believe we are in times of spiritual renewal. Look, I'm going to confess something. Something that I don't think I have said before, but I'm going to take this opportunity to say it now. Seeing all the barbarities, the nonsense, the crazy things, terrible that have been preaching and teaching in the congregations many times as a pastor I felt shame of others. And I have said the Lord, till when, Lord, till when your church will be deceived? Until when will there be authentic and a people that is living out of the gospel that they are taking and harm the credit of the gospel, the ministry? Till when there will be people that will be manipulating your word and hurting good people and healthy people who love and want to learn from the word? Lord, ask for love to your name. Clean, clean your beloved church. I know there is a long way to go, but dear brothers, how many of you have said glory to God for what I have heard from what I have learned the scales have fallen from my eyes I have been able to know that there are no curses in my life that there are no demons in the life of a Christian who walks in obedience and holiness I do not have to be afraid of anything or anyone if I go for a congregation because there are false doctrines there are human doctrines and even diabolical doctrines uh, the Lord is not going to punish me on the contrary, I do not want to be a partner in lies or deceit or manipulation because we are in times of refreshment. Before the coming of the Lord, I believe that the Lord was going to deal with his church in an extraordinary way as he is doing. And if only this year, look what I'm going to tell you now, if, if only one person throughout this year that we have spent hours and hours and hours broadcasting to be able to help, to be able to guide many people, Although this has earned us reins of criticism and jealousy and envy and of people who have dedicated themselves to trying to discredit us, etc., etc., God knows everything. If only one person in this time has fallen in love with Lord again and has awakened from his deep sleep and has returned to get into the things of the Lord, glory to God has been worth it. For this reason, the book of the Song of Songs is much more than the story of a love between a man and a woman. It is the stream of a passionate love of a God madly in love with the human race, of a God who loves man and is capable of even sending his son, which I would never do, and none of us of us, uh, none of the ones who are fathers or mothers would send our children to be killed and reject them and spit them out. We will never do that. But God, he did. He sent his beloved son. And is that we, I have no words to thank God for what he did for us. What he did for me, sent his son to die for me. It's something we cannot understand. I believe there is not a preacher in the world who be able in a message or in a thousand sermons to explain the love of God. The love of God is something that has captivated us, something that has transformed us forever, that God sent his son to die for me, to die for my sins. I should have died, but not him. But he said, no, I'm going to take your place. I'm going to spill my blood that you don't have to shed a single drop of yours. Look, a few days ago with some scissors, I cut myself, I cut my finger and a lot of blood came out until then it stopped and blood is something that many people 
to many people it produces like nervousness and some faint when they see blood. Imagine the blood of Jesus Christ power poured out on the cross for our sins. It's something that there is no sermon, there is no preacher who can explain this. It's something immeasurable. It's something really, really great. This is why the sister who asked, I don't understand, I don't know what purpose the book of the Son of Songs have. I have, it's explained in a very objective way through human love, divine love, so as we can understand that God is serious and that God is love and prove it. Good, let's answer more questions because I start talking and talking and I forget that I still have a lot of questions in front of me. There is a sister who asks in the book uh, of uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 10, let's read it. Book of Acts, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, she asks if these people, these characters, who we are going to read it, who are they? And with the eyes set on heaven, this is the day of the ascension of Christ, while he was living Here, two men in white robes stood next to them. And if you, if you ask, who were these two men with white robes? Who were they? It's true that the Bible does not say the name or who they were, but if you allow me to give a personal opinion, and I have not seen any comments, or I haven't been looking at another explanation, but I always believe, and excuse me if my answer maybe for you, some of you is not correct, some of, I always believe that they were angels. I, I always believe that the time of ascension, they were angels, and these two men with white robes, it could be that they were angels, that they were the ones who spoke with the disciples, telling them, do not worry, that this same one that has gone to heaven is the same one that will also Uh, will come as you have seen him today so the answer I think that uh, they are angels that were at that moment on the day of the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ and then there is a very interesting question also that makes Ariana she asks in the verse Matthew 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 23, and I asked once myself this question, so it got my attention that someone asked something that at a time also I also asked myself. It didn't worry, but, uh, but I wanted to find an explanation. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it says, and he came and he lived This is when uh, Jesus comes uh, uh, return from Egypt and they go to Nazareth, the town of Nazareth. Says he came, I live in the city that are called Nazareth, so that was said by the prophets would be fulfilled. At least in King James it says in plural by the prophets, that it would be called Nazarene. I don't know what I had in mind, logically, I don't know what had in mind Matthew when he wrote and he said this, but the prophets, in plural, they did not say, they did not speak that he would be called a Nazarene because he lived in Nazareth. I, we already explained the difference the other day, the difference between Nazareo, it was the man who made a vow, remember, we spoke about Samson, and Nazarene, who is Hinabitan, a person from the town of Nazareth. Now, if you look at your Bible, I'm reading in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, There is a quote at the bottom of the page that it says Isaiah 11.1. 1. And of course, then, when you read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, At least it happened to me. I said, well, what relation does Matthew says uh, with, uh, about Jesus with Isaiah 11.1? Because it says, a rod will come out of the trunk of Isaiah. Isaiah was the father of the King David. A shoot will sprout from his root. Its root. Now, analyzing the text in Hebrew, the word stem in Hebrew is the word netzer. Netzer. N-E-T-Z-E-R. And it looks a lot like the word 
Night Sea, es la palabra Nazarene. Which is the word Nazarene. Puede ser. It may be. Puede ser. It could be. The most lógica logical explanation es que is that as the word bastard, stem is pronounced in a very muy, muy similar way to the word Nazarene in Hebrew, it may be that of there Matthew draw the conclusion that this text of Isaiah 11.1 refers to the fact of Jesus living in the town of Nazareth. So it would be called Nazarene. But there are no other prophecies, there are no other prophets that support that Matthew is saying here in this, this would be the explanation. More logical of this text, of this prophecy. According, according we advance. The angels travel at the speed of the light or faster? Look, John. I don't have the faintest idea how fast do angels travel. I do not know if they travel at the speed at the speed of the light. If I'm not mistaken, I think they are 350,000 kilometers per second, or faster or slower. I have no the remotest idea. In fact, honestly, I have never asked myself, worried or wondered how fast angels travel. I honestly can't give you an answer because since the Bible does not say how fast they travel, how I'm going to give it to you, where I'm going to get that answer from. So we will speak the Lord, if you are okay with that, when we reach in his presence, uh, and he uh, can tell us what speed do the angels travel. As the Bible doesn't say it, I cannot give you an answer, I could be lying. Some, I would be saying something totally out, out of place if I told you uh, the speed the angels travel because I don't know. Another question comes. If God is perfect, why did he create a disorderly and empty earth as in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says? I have read that the words in the original text are to and bow. Yeah, que significa which sin means no. without ornaments. Y babojo, no, sin no they significa does not babojo. mean without ornaments. They mean something eh, else. Y dice que And no it says that persona. it's not the same. En de In 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 14, 14 verse 33, dice, it says, no because God is not a God of, a God of bueno, disorder. No de well, does that not say, no uh, first of Corinthians, does not say that it's not a God of disorder. The King James Version, it says that it's not a God of confusion, that is different. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Well, to summarize, could you explain why the Bible says that God created an earth, mercy, and empty? Is that the Bible does not say this. The Bible says that in the beginning, in the beginning, God originally created heaven and earth. And then, verse 2 says, the earth, he created the higher and the lower, And the earth went into a state of chaos, went into a state of disorder, eh, darkness, eh, completely changed what God had created in the beginning. Because if you realize in Genesis chapter 1, more than the tale of the creation, the story of the creation, although there are also parts that God is creating, but really, if you realize what that God is doing, is putting in order the creation that has been disordered, altered, changed, and now we will explain why. Expert commentators says that between Genesis 1 One and Genesis 1-2, something happened. Something happened that the earth was no longer what it was at first. Some attribute this chaos, this disorder, this darkness, and they attribute it to rebellion of Satan who was thrown to the ground and then there was a chaos in the earth as a result of the fall of Satan. It was what they usually say. Now, to this person who has done uh, this, this question, I'm going to give you a verse In fact, in fact, it could be good if you all notice it and then you read it. The palabra tohu, babohu, which are the ones that are translated by disorder and empty, are almost, almost, we could say two synonymous words, although they are two words, but they are like words that almost mean the same thing. 
is one expression of astonishment. It's saying, what has happened? How is all of this? It's an incoherence that is empty and it could uh, follow. If Jeremiah 4, 23, those two words that appear in Genesis 1, 2 are also there in Jeremiah 4, 23. Read it and you see those two words, how they were translated, which are exactly the same as those that appear in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. God is putting the world in order. God separates the water above from the waters below. He's not creating the waters. Then they were already existed. And when the waters separate and one remains above and the other remains below, the earth comes out. Then the earth was already there. God is creating. He's put, God is not creating. He's putting in order a creation that has been altered, that once it adorns it, uh, once God orders it and gives order, once God puts everything in its place, then God saw that everything was again in balance, in harmony, and in absolute perfection. Then is when he created men. And he tells the man, there you have. This is so you can take care of it. So you can enjoy this beautiful, beautiful land with a perfect climate, with a balanced nature, etc. And he gives it to the man so that he is going, let's say, like a representative of God takes church and takes care of God's creation. Incidentally, man has made it fatal because there is no more damage to creation than that one that the man has done. Does not cease to amaze, to, doesn't not seem to amaze me because man is really uh, ending up with his own planet and the house where we live is deteriorating men more and more what God creates. So it's not that God created a messy earth. It's that something happened, we don't know exactly what, but it altered everything. But God created everything perfectly in order Okay, eh, una, una let's hermana, answer another question. A sister, Leticia, Leticia asks, eh, based on 27, Numbers eh, chapter 27, what is it Urim, about consulting Urim, God through Urim and Burim? Lights and perfection is what it pues, means. The, those were Urim and Tubim, two stones del, del eh, that the high priest carried sacerdote. in a back inside his breastplate apart from the stones that he carried on his chest with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel he carried 12 stones called uh, Urim and Tubim and that they were used in times of need for a quick response some think that uh, one stone could be white and the other one could be black Let's say like the white one uh, was yes and the black one was no. So when you had to consult God for a quick answer, there was no time to pray for a long time. There was no time to fast. There was no time to wait because the enemy could come upon us uh, and the tragedy come. They consulted with Urim and Tubim, those two stones that represented yes and no to get a quick answer from God. That is what uh, it's these two stones. Also, others say that these stones lifted up and reflected the letters of the Aleph Bet, of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but that would be another uh, something, another thing. The position of Satan in Apocalypse, in the Gospels, uh, to what the Bible tells us about Satan, how the pres how we enter the presence of God in the book of Job has radically changed. That is to say, in the book of Job, uh, Jesus, the Lord Jesus uh, still had not died on the cross. He had not risen. Therefore, the position of Satan, his situation, his freedom, in quotes, uh, uh, in that uh, times had nothing to do in those times uh, let's say uh, once uh, Jesus defeated him on the cross of Calvary with a death wound whom, from which he will never recover Satan has lost all his privilege and that access that he had he has 
falling is a defeated being. It's a being that enjoys conditional freedom, but it's a being that is totally defeated. And the victory of Jesus, uh, ha, the Lord has delegated us to us in such way that we are no longer victims of the enemy or his station. We are not victims of his machinations or of his trees because now we the one who is in us is greater than the enemy and therefore you are totally defeated uh, he is totally defeated and defeated he is like a lion a kind of hungry rolling lion looking for someone to devour but he's a bitter being he's frustrated being he's wandering being without family without friends without nothing that he knows he is condemned to death and has nothing and he has nothing to do and he cannot destroy the Lord's church. Jesus Christ conquered Satan with a death wound and he will never recover from it. Therefore, the position of Satan today is completely different from the position he had and the privilege uh, before the crucifixion and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. A question that a brother um, does to us, Joseph, uh, when a charismatic uh, Catholic talks about his change due to the renewal that the Holy Spirit has given him, Really, uh, who is acting in this charismatic Catholic? Good, I believe that is the Holy Spirit. He can work in Catholic charismatics and in good evangelicals and Pentecostals and Baptists and all kind of people. I believe the Holy Spirit does not have any limitation when uh, he's saying, oops, I cannot touch the heart of this atheist because he's an atheist, or I cannot convince of sin, nor I can act in the life of this man because it turns out that he's a charismatic Catholic, he's an evangelical Baptist, he's a Pentecostal evangelical. I believe that these limitations we have invaten, invented us. If a Christian, or if, like you say, a charismatic, Catholic says that the Holy Spirit has renewed it well because the Bible says something very important that by its fruits you will know them. I can say uh, what I want, but uh, by their fruits, let's see what fruits they have, what changes, what uh, he says has changed him and has transformed. We cannot say because he's a charismatic Catholic, God cannot work in his life. No, no, we cannot say that. Let's not talk like this because we are talking without realizing from a platform of arrogance and pride, believing that as evangelical Christians, God cannot deal with Catholics or atheists. See if the Lord has shown us something at this time since March of last year until today is that God has broken many schemes. I do not say thousands because it's probably exaggerated, but many Catholics, many Catholics sincere have reached the conviction of the truth. And I see many Catholics who have truly become a stronger and with clearer and more radical ideas to serve God than many who call themselves evangelical Christians. So that since I'm an evangelical Christian, it seems like I have the monopoly, I have the exclusivity of the Holy Spirit, and this man, he says he's a charismatic or a Catholic, well, then we are going to see the change that has taken place in that evangelical Christian. I was going to make uh, this question. All uh, evangelical Christians are giving good testimony in the world. I thank God that I converted many years ago. But today, with the bad testimony that many Christians have given and do, including people who call themselves servants of God, I would never convert in life. But rather, uh, I would be getting vaccinated against the gospel. Therefore, let's remove our titles. We are going to take off the labels and we are going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in those he wants, as he wants and when he wants. Automatically, when uh, a, a Catholic charismatic who says that the Holy Spirit is transforming him, so what, the Lord cannot do it? Who told you that the Lord cannot act and change and transform a, transform a charismatic Catholic? 
cannot no convert, no cannot change, idolatría, cannot no live idolatry, de, cannot de stop worshiping images. No dan testimonio, claro, no dan testimonio. ¿Quién no, no dan testimonio? No, don't give testimony who doesn't give testimony. The Catholics, the evangelicals or the human being. Because no when it comes to giving testimony, it's not otra. about being one thing or the other. It's about Dios, that as children of God, we have to give testimony. And I tell you something, my dear brothers. Many are, many are those who are truly converted to the Lord and are coming out of idolatry and are coming out of darkness and are setting an example to many religious to many religious because in the evangelical world is full of religious brothers believe me there is a tremendous religiosity that spirit of religious that I speak in, if I speak in tongues, I give tithe, I do this, I do the other. There is a spirit of religiosity, which I call a spirit of pride, a spirit of pride that makes us feel as superior to others. That is a terrible thing. I have a friend that I said, oh, he says to me, I'm a charismatic, uh, I've got a friend uh, that tells me I'm a Catholic charismatic and the uh, Holy Spirit is renewing me. Glory to God. Let's keep renewing you, but not you all only, but also me. Or is that that we don't need to be renewed every day by the Holy Spirit? Of course, of course. Well, I'm going to see if I, there's any more questions, and if not, then we will conclude this round of questions. Uh, for today, I see that I have answered all the questions that they have uh, gave them to me today, surely more will arrive through the, during the week. And as always, I will do my best to be next Monday here at 6 o'clock Canary Island time. I want to thank all of you for connecting. I know that for many of you are complicated hours. Many of you are working. But truly, Pero God verdad, bless you for the effort you make because you are an example. When people write to me and call me and says, right now I'm listening to the devotional and it's 3 a.m. in the morning. As in the other day, our brother's man in Colombia, he said, Pastor, it's 3 in the morning, I'm waiting for the devotional to begin. Dear brothers, the truth is that the example the support, the affection and love that you have shown and continue to show toward us, I have no words. I have no words to thank you for everything that the Lord has given us and has given during all this time since, Mar since March. I was telling the other day to Elena, my wife, God changed our lives since March. There is a before and there is an after. Since that confinement of March 14, 2020 to today, we have met thousands of brothers, families, extraordinary people. We have seen how the Lord has acted in hundreds and thousands of people that we don't know personally because you always play with advantage. You see us, but I don't see any of you. But the truth is that we are tremendously grateful to the Lord because we have learned together, we have cried together, we have loved together, we have enjoyed together, and we are together seeing the glory of the Lord. And as he is doing a wonderful work, because as I said before, we are in times of change where God is working in his church as never before. And many, when they return to their congregations, it will not be as before, because now they have acquired a knowledge and now know some things that they did not know before. And now we have attached to the word in such a way that in the moment you hear something that is not biblical, you will see how you will have an authority to be able to react in a different way and not say amen, amen, amen to everything that was said. Because now the light of the word of God, we can say that is not of God and everything and all the glory we will, of course, give it to the Lord who's what do you think, brothers, if we finish with a prayer this evening? I will try, little by little, to read all the comments that I have been receiving, see that they do not stop entering, they do not stop entering comments. It's impossible to read them while I'm talking to you, but I will read them carefully. And also, as I have a week to read everything you have uh, written, I will try to read and we'll, we'll, let's pray.
Te doy muchísimas gracias. Thank you, my God, este uh, for this privilege, this wonderful opportunity that you have given us one more day to be able to reach to so many lives that are hungry and thirsty for your presence and your word. Help us to serve you, to know you better every day, to strive to allow your Holy Spirit to bring renewal to our lives. Save our life as you have done till today. Give us health and physical strength, spiritual and mental strength, and save us your save your beloved church bless it and use it as you have never done before continue to break hearts continue to bring conviction of sins to life sins to life so that we can see unprecedented spiritual awakening in our generation thanks for all the changes you have produced and for all the lives that have approached and known you in the time in this time and we will give you as always all the glory and the honor to you in the name of Jesus Amen. Dear brothers, thank you for your prayers, for your support. Thank you, all of you, for your love. We will see you tomorrow, if possible, in the morning, in the devotional. Tomorrow, we will continue examining in the light of our daily devotional. Different themes, different passages of the Bible. May the Lord bless you. May he keep us, and may you all have a good afternoon. Blessing, brothers.